What's up, Internet? Welcome to Once Over. I'm Kaylee, and this is producer Chris, and hey. today we're going to be giving the once over to being there. There will be spoilers. Chris, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Yeah, tell everybody where they can find you. You can find me on every Who Are These podcast, W-A-T-P. Go to whoarethese.com to find out all about it. And also about someone named Lucy Tightbox. Ooh. I am very fortunate. I get to hang out with you once a week on Wednesday nights talking on WATP, which is just lovely. And I am honored to have you here wow. talking with me about being there, which is a movie that both you and I absolutely love. Yes, and you are fortunate. Uh, it's, <laughs> okay. Please go on. <laughs> so Being There came out in 1979, and it was directed by Hal Ashby, mm -hmm. who is a director that both you and I love. Yes. Um, famously, Harold and Maude. Shine, shine, shine. Shampoo. Why would my being a f have anything to do with that? The last detail was the one that caught my attention. I am the motherfucking shore patrol, motherfucker. How have I not seen that? How do I not know about that? Uh, I don't know what to tell you. All right, well, I'm behind the times. That, that'll that be my tonight's uh, homework. All right. So being there um, is kind of about the clashing of the reality of the world versus the fakeness of the world. Mm. And we get to see that in the character of Chance or Chauncey. We will get into why it's Chauncey. Who's played by? Peter Sellers. Peter Sellers. The amazing Peter Sellers. <laughs> Better than ever. Taka! Taka! What kind of a candle is this? This movie really dives into the idea of if chance can affect change on the world just by being there. That's pretty much it. All right, so let's get into the actual movie itself. The film starts out with Chance being asleep. We don't actually get to see him yet. We have a blank screen. The movie starts out in darkness, which is a great point that you brought up. During the credits, we establish a lot about Chance. And that's what I love about the, the flow of this movie, which never changes. You think it's slow, yet it's captivating. Um, we have a blank TV. And the first noise that we get to hear is a remote clicking. And the reason for this is because Chance is a character who is a gardener, but is extremely obsessed with watching TV. I do think that it is important to actually talk about his mental health because it's not all there. And this was a time where mental health issues were not being discussed. And people who had mental health issues were very much being kept in almost captivity. Chance is working for a rich man as a gardener. We learn that he's habitual, loves TVs, there's a TV in every room, and he loves gardening. But one of the characters is a suit that he wears, correct? Yes, I absolutely, I would completely agree with that. Yeah, it's a device, the movie could not survive without the suit that he's wearing, but... Well, the other character, the first character that we get introduced to other than Chance is actually Louise, yes. the maid. Good morning, Louise. Who's played by Ruth Attaway, um, who's also in Taking a Pelham 123, which is another great 70s movie. So Louise the maid comes in to tell Chance that the old man, who is how he is named, has died. Yes. And Louise is quite horrified by the fact that Chance shows almost no emotion about this situation. The old man's dead. Chance? Well. This is the person who has been employing him, who has been taking care of him. We don't entirely know their relationship. Chance just doesn't give a fuck. That old man is lying up there dead as hell, and it just don't make any difference to you. And all while this is happening on the TV, Chance is watching a Sesame Street episode yeah. where the song Different People, Different Ways is playing. Different people. And that's our introduction to Chance, we now know he for sure is different. Yeah, it's actually not a bad song, as I myself am a <laughs> gardener, so I really feel for this guy. And it's, it's a cool tune, and Big Bird's awesome. Yeah, so he truly is. What do you want from me? He truly is. Chance goes and sees the dead old man, um, but his immediate reaction to that is putting on the TV. He is so wrapped up in the fakeness 
in the sub-reality of television, in the what can I be seen, in the voyeuristic watching of what is on the screen, that he cannot experience reality. Also important to note is that he mimics things, and that's how he's going to get through the movie. <laughs> yes. So anytime that he sees somebody shaking hands on the TV, he mimics that action yeah. so that he can learn how to behave in society. After that, we are introduced to estate attorneys who show up at the, at the house, Tom and Sally. They're nice. Mr. Chance, I'm very pleased to meet you. Yes. Yes. And actually, speaking of Sesame Street, do you know who Sally is? Get the fuck out. We're going to talk about it right now. She's Fran Br Brill, I think it is. She is a puppeteer on Sesame Street. Aww. I know. Wonderful, right? Yeah, there was a lot of um, PBS going on. Yeah. Because there's some Mr. Rogers and some other shit. Hal really likes to talk about social normativity, and he also likes to talk about politics and um, society. And because of that, we get to see a lot of the presidential politics, but we also get to see a lot of the politics of childhood. And spoiler alert, it's not subtle. It's a little ham-fisted. Yes, it's true. That's a very Hal Ashby thing to do. So when we get introduced to the estate attorneys, Tom and Sally, they arrive and they say, hey, there's no mention of a gardener mm -hmm. at all. Right. So you got to get the hell out of here. That's the long and short of it. He gives them a little tour and says, well, here's your evidence. You got me and you've got these this really old wardrobe that I can pick juice from. And uh, we got these plants here. Yeah, and I took care of them. And I watch TV. There's a TV in every room of the house. Yes. I do think that this is an interesting scene, and I think that there is a possible theory about this movie that relates to the end of the film about who is Chance really, and is it possible that he is just a ghost? So mm -hmm. we will talk about that more as we get into the end of the film. Well... Get a little scared, but... I know. Spooky stuff. Mm -hmm. After they tell him to leave, we go into one of the most iconic sections of the film, yes. which is him going out into the world, all to a funk version of also Sprocked Zarathustra. That's a name of a song I can't say, but it's the song from 2001 yeah. Space Odyssey. Uh, pa, pa, you get it. Yes. So we know right off the bat that this is going to be a super enlightenment part of the film. Yeah, we also realize they're in a piece of shit part of the city. It is a very nice house that is just, I don't know, in a gerbil ball yeah. of downtown Washington, D.C. It is a total slum. And so this is so beautiful because, again, you were talking about Chance's suit. Yes. We get to see him in this absolutely beautiful suit. He looks professional as shit. He's carrying a briefcase. And everything around him is garbage. Yes. There is graffiti on the walls that says America ain't shit because the white man's got a god complex. Um, I, I wrote that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We're seeing, again, how the suit becomes a character in and of itself. It's a great reveal. Even though I've seen this many times, it still strikes me because of the opening of the film. And I would say it's an early introduction to Act 2. I'd say we get there a little quick for your average film. Yeah. And this runs about just over two hours. So here we are. We're so a the gardener stepping outside for the first time. He has not been outside. In his own words, he has not been outside this property ever. And we don't know how he got there. Another important point we might want to bring Maybe up. Maybe he is a ghost. Well, an angel? Oh. Hmm. All right, whatever. Keep going. <laughs> He's walking down the median into downtown D.C. He's heading towards the Capitol building and all that shit. And it is the funkified version of the theme to 2001 that we can't pronounce by Diodato, I want yeah. to say. Thank you. Diodato. Look it up. It really is. I, I absolutely love the song. And again, we're making reference to 2001 A Space Odyssey. No! This is blatant reference, and oh, yeah. it is only going to get more impactful as the movie continues. So as he walks down that wonderful median and we get that gorgeous shot, we also have a couple of other moments where he interacts with society here. So he watches some kids play basketball from outside of a fence, which again is very voyeuristic. It's almost as if he would prefer to be watching the television. And now he is seeing these kids playing basketball. 
And that is kind of how he's able to associate yes. with the world. In a couple seconds, Peter Sellers conveys to us that he has seen this on TV and he's enjoying it with a very naive kind of smile. Oh, I've seen people like this before. Yes. And he also um, asks a black lady to make his lunch for him. Yeah. Could you give me some lunch? Just like Louise, who, by the way, was a black lady. Yes. We did not. Okay. So, uh, you know, I mean, he does not understand how the world works, and that is what we are gathering from the scene. The most important part, or one of the biggest interactions that he has within this kind of area of the film, is that he sees a bunch of kids, mm -hmm. and he goes and he starts asking them questions. He wants to find garden work. A garden? Oh, no. you me? And they pull a knife on him. Yeah. 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 And his response to that is, <laughs> he wants to change the channel, because yes. that's all he knows. He's scared, he doesn't like what he's seen, so he wants to change the channel. Yeah, this is the first interaction that he's had um, since Louis has yelled at him about not caring about the old man dying. Uh, he's had nothing like this happen, yes. and he just wants to change the channel. It's the first real moment that we see emotion, but not too much emotion from yes. him. We're not going to see that for a while. Calm down. Now move, monkey. Slice that monkey, man. Cut your white ass. Yes. Also, one of the kids um, that is in that little group is Otis Burbridge, I think is his name, who was in the Almond Brothers. <laughs> Fuck out. Uh, cool, right? <laughs> I should have known that, but... I know. Come on. Uh, where are you? I will see myself out. Now move, donkey. What happens is he continues along on his journey, and this leads him to seeing himself on a CCTV. So he's looking at a TV store, yes. and they have a, t a camera, and so he sees himself on television for the it's first 1979. time. And this is particularly exciting for me because it is so related to 2001 A Space Odyssey. We get, in the background of that scene, there is moon iconography. Again, we're still hearing the 2001 A Space Odyssey theme song. Yes. We also get to see how reflective, I think. I, I almost feel like this was Hal Ashby understanding the monolith from 2001 in a yes. way that nobody else ever had, or in a way that hadn't been talked about at least at the time. He understood that the monolith was intended to be reflective, and here we are getting to see Chance Chauncey right. being reflective because now he understands that he can both be on TV and in reality for the first time. Whew. Also within the plot, which we should be following as a, an earthling, he doesn't know what the fuck he's going to do at this point, and no. we don't know what Chance is going to do. But he's more entertained, you know, he's probably hungry and cold at this point. Yep. It is winter. The snow is about to fall, because he was concerned about the garden. We're wondering, what's this guy going to do? And he is more entertained by seeing himself on camera uh, in front of an electronics store. Yes, than anything else. And we then get to see the the pivotal moment in the film. He gets hit by a limousine. Oh! Very sorry, sir. I didn't see you. Yes, this changes everything. This does change everything. And we as the audience don't see that from the perspective of the film. We actually see that on the TV. Oh! So the moment where he actually gets hit, oh! we are watching it on the TV. Oh! which I think is really interesting because it brings up the question of, again, what is reality and what is not reality? We did cover that he's dressed to the nines, right? He is dressed to the nines. He's got the best umbrella. Is that a bowler hat? A uh, double breast suit from the 20s that our um, real estate attorney has pointed out is coming back in fashion in yes. the 70s. Yeah. He looks like somebody. As he, he, as he gets hit by a limousine, yes. you can see where we're going with this. So this is going to lead into a new chapter in Chance's life. The passenger in the limousine, the owner of the limousine, is Eve, played yeah. by Shirley MacLaine. Oh, man. You know, why don't you come and it'll be that much more pleasant for you. So when Eve realizes that they have hit somebody, she is very concerned. She doesn't want to get sued. And so she invites Chance to come for a ride in the car in order for him to be able to be taken care of. I insist. This is the first automobile ride that Chance has taken. 
This is just like television, only you can see much further. It is. And it's also about to be the first alcoholic drink he's ever had. It sure is. <laughs> Which is the other character I was thinking of. Not just the suit, but the drink itself is such a plot device. It can't happen without it, because after the drink, he's known as... Chauncey Gardner. Because he's choking on alcohol that he's never had before. Chauncey Gardner. So she believes that he truly is somebody. Yeah, and it's a good name. It is. Yeah. Anytime that you bring this movie up to somebody else, they always say, oh, Chauncey Gardner. Yeah, of course. That is, that's the thing from this film. Mr. Chauncey Gardner. What I think is interesting about the limo ride is that it is the first time that Chauncey is getting to see the difference between choosing what you see on TV versus seeing the world outside of that. So he realizes for the first time, and he is overstimulated by the fact that he can see things outside of the TV screen within this limo ride. He also realizes within the limo that he has lost his remote, which means and signifies the loss of control for him. Yes. In his um, overstimulation, Eve also becomes a little bit overstimulated because he chooses to put the news on television, and Eve does not like that very much. So in response, Chauncey changes the channel for us to all hear Basketball Jones. Yes, I'm glad you brought up Basketball Jones. I need help, ladies and gentlemen. I need someone to stand beside me. I need, I need, I need someone to stand up for me at the free throw line. Basketball Jones. Basketball Jones. Basketball Jones. <laughs> I wondered as a youth, well, a 20-year-old watching this movie for the first time, what the fuck is that doing in there? What is the symbol? I get it now. It's a Cheech and Chong thing. It's animated. I don't know what it's from. I don't really care. I'm yeah. not a big Cheech and Chong guy, but yeah. it just sounds like someone who's getting in over their head with stardom. Absolutely. So I think more than getting in over your head that that song is about addiction. Oh. So we went from... Enlightenment. We went from the Enlightenment of 2001, A Space Odyssey, to a song that is about being so addicted to basketball that you can't behave normally, which <laughs> mirrors Chauncey's enlightenment of experiencing the real world into his, but wait, he's still addicted to television so much that he can't actually experience the real world. Yeah, it's funny when you're watching the character go through this experience that we're about to experience with him. We forget about the TV addiction because we know that he's going through this for the first time. Yeah. And yet he's just going from rich person house to rich person house. So that's where we've arrived. Is it uh, yeah. Eve's house? Yes. Yeah. Which by the way, is a great scene with the limo pulling up in the rain, all the people greeting them. Uh, it looks like a funeral scene. There's a lot of black umbrellas. The whole team is uh, awaiting Eve's arrival with this uh, mysterious stranger. I would call that a key image from the film. I would as well. And I think you're totally right. I never thought about that being funeral-esque, but it absolutely is. And not only that, because Chauncey's leg is injured, when he arrives, they put him in a wheelchair and they lift him up almost like pallbearers. Yes. It is very funeralistic. I never thought about that. Eve's intent of bringing him back home is that she wants to take care of him because she basically is concerned that she's going to get sued. She knows she has a lot of money. Yeah. That's where she is at. And so this is after she brings Chauncey back to her compound, is what I want to call it, more than a house, mm -hmm. mansion, very extravagant lifestyle. Chauncey gets to meet Ben, her husband, mm -hmm. for the first time, who is played by Melvin David Douglas. Welcome to Rand Memorial Hospital. Thank you. Ben, we find out, is very sickly, and it turns out that he is dying of a young person's disease, is yeah. how he describes it. Aplastic anemia, I want to say. The bone marrow doesn't supply enough red blood cells. Yeah, something I haven't heard of before nor since. Yes. Uh, but it was a touching scene when he says, it's ironic that I'm dying of a young man's disease. Yes. Yeah. Um, and Melvin, 
No, now you got me confused. Davis or Douglas? Douglas. Okay. It's Douglas. Yeah. He was the man in the 70s. Oh, yeah. He got around. Yeah. Yeah. So, very believable, very likable. Ben Rand is yes. the character. So, during this time, um, Chance actually gets to see a doctor. One of the doctors that he sees is a black doctor. And he asks him, Do you know Raphael? Because that's what the kids were asking him about earlier. No, sir, I don't believe I do. Right. To us, it's a key scene because it becomes a blooper reel at the end, but they cut the scene from the movie. They did. So we don't know the context until we see the hilarity at the end. Yes, so but, who, who is Raphael? This was where we're at yeah, at this point. Yeah. I don't know. I'll cut yeah. your ass off. <laughs> <laughs> this is when we get into the domestic life that is Chance. So he now is living on the compound with them while his leg heals from the limousine accident, and he is basically just wanting to garden and watch TV, which is all that he knows. I would like to work in your garden. Correct. However, both Eve and Ben are quickly misinterpreting his stupidity and naivety for extremely prophetic and thoughtful messages. This is the crux where the viewer needs to suspend disbelief for it to become either an important movie or a wicked dumb movie, I think. If you're not willing to do that, you're not gonna like this movie at fucking all. So what do you think happens if it becomes a dumb movie? I don't you know. just hate you just hate I, the I, entire rest of it? I'm a for liking it. Yeah. But I'm also a gardener in my part time, so yeah. but you must know what I mean, because they misinterpret everything he says as sage wisdom. Yes. Because that's what they want to hear. Ben I know exactly what he means. The guy in the elevator also wants to hear hilarity. <laughs> Sorry, sir. Oh, you're oh, mean. Thought. People put words in this guy's mouth for the rest of the film, and he's okay with it because he's getting through, he's getting fed, and he's used to a certain way of life, even for being a <laughs> gardener. And he probably doesn't even understand that people are misinterpreting him. Oh, not at all. He's just saying what he believes to be the case. I'm a very good gardener. It's such a pleasant way to forget one's troubles. Well, the way he sells it is I'm comfortable with getting by. That's what I take. Ben is incredibly rich and is in the president's ear about finance. Yes. Is that fair yeah. to say? Yeah. He's a, I would say he's a consultant to the president. And because of that, and because Ben has started to take a liking to Chauncey, he introduces Chauncey to the president. Hello. Yes. Now, this scene, I think, is um, impactful for a couple of reasons. The first thing that I want to talk about within it is that Ben, in order to prepare for meeting the president, does a lot of things like putting makeup on and trying to make himself presentable because he does not want to appear sickly and therefore useless in front of the president. However, Chauncey does not need to take those same actions, partially because he is just being there. Yeah, yeah, there it is, there it is. And also partially because... He already looks the part with his suit that has become so much a character in and of itself. Yeah, also his haircut is very nice, so we have to assume that someone was coming in and cutting his hair all the time. That's but, a great point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the dude looks nice for 50-whatever. So Chauncey's first words to the president are, you look smaller on TV. <laughs> yes. I must warn you that Chauncey's not a man to bandy words. <laughs> Which Chauncey, of course, means literally. And the president takes it as, oh, I look fat. And this is uh, Jack Warden, yeah. who plays this Joe Sixpack president to the T. And Jack Warden, I, I would give you his credits, but he was just all over the place in yeah. the 70s. He, more of a character actor, I would say. Yeah. It rhymes with cock. But sells it as the guy who could be like, eh, go fuck yourself. Yeah. <laughs> and it's for you. Don't come sucking around me if you want something. The only thing you'll get from me is this. <laughs> this is where it really takes off that everything that Chauncey says is getting interpreted in a completely different way than what he means. Because this is where he starts giving the president metaphors about gardens and growth having its yes. season. And the president takes that to mean economic growth, where, of course, Chauncey means flowers grow in certain seasons. Well, yeah, because Ben Rand's new friend is 
taking him seriously and Ben's got the money. So it's all about money and this is where it gets a little bit uh, heavy handed. Yes. Unfortunately, because it is a beautiful movie that I love. It is. I will say though that this scene reminds me a lot of, have you ever seen Joe Dirt? You suck! You do! Yeah, I love uh, Life's a Garden, Dig It. And I feel like that whole, like, <laughs> I I just feel like there's a little bit of a reference in there. And I, or at least I want there to be, damn it. Okay. So although the president likes Chauncey, and or at least seems to like him, he definitely is suspicious. Well, yeah, because he calls him Bobby on the way out, yeah. which he doesn't care for. No. <laughs> so the president orders a background check on Chauncey, which... The results of which we won't find out for a little bit, but the results are basically just about the clothes that he's wearing. Much like the Joker, in a weird way. Yeah. By erasing my mind. Even though the president is a little bit suspicious, Ben continues to be extremely impressed by Chauncey. And this is when Eve starts to really develop some interest in him as well. So we should put ages on our characters here. Ben's about 102. (laughs) Yes. Eve, I'd put it 60. Maybe 50. Well, a 60, I would do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's fucking Shirley like, McLean. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and apparently, Chance is 52, I believe they yeah. put his character in. Yeah. By the way, I'm 52. Oh, I almost grew up on that one. It's you. <laughs> Hi, Chauncey. <laughs> So at this point in the film, Chauncey is getting shown the gardens of this beautiful estate that yeah. Eve and Ben live and they are on. they're impressive. They're amazing gardens. Eve asks Chauncey about Louise, yeah. specifically. Louise was the maid. Yeah. And Eve seems very jealous of it. So stupid of me. You know, I thought maybe she was perhaps someone you were romantically involved with. She's like, are you banging? Oh, yeah. Probably. Yeah. How, how come you uh, miss Louise so much? And then she finds out that Louise was the maid. Which, yeah. again, that almost gives Chauncey more credentials because now it seems like he's rich enough that he had a maid when, of course, he did not. He did not. No. no. The president, despite questioning Chauncey's credentials, he gives a speech on TV and actually quotes Chauncey, which is the first time that Chauncey gets real accolades. The economic prospects are undoubtedly sunny. Oh. (laughs) Warren! What I think is interesting about the scene where the president is mentioning Chauncey and giving him his street cred is that we see part of that scene on the television and we see part of that scene as the film watcher, which means that we are effectively Chauncey entering the real world because now it's, it's again, that moment where he's on the CCTV, he gets to see himself, but he also gets to see the things that are outside of the television screen. It absolutely changes your perception of how you watch the film. Yes. With all of the different cameras going on. Yes. And we get to see also people reacting to the president talking about Chauncey. So we get to see all of the other people that are in the room kind of like... Saying, is this bullshit? Yeah. Should I be eating this bullshit? Yep. And as a result of all of that, Chauncey actually gets calls for TV spots. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. So yes. he now gets to officially be on TV, not just on the CCTV. And like he says, he claims... I've been on television. Because of standing in front of the electronics Which store. is real. Yes. That's, that is a true fact. The makeup artist who's like getting him ready for his TV spot mm-hmm. is Sam Wiseman, who is the director of the Mighty Ducks D2. And also George... How of, did I not recognize him? George oh. of the Jungle, too. Oh my God. <laughs> He went on to do great things. Why am I talking about films? I know. Fucking idiot. When he gets these TV spots, Tom and Sally, who were the estate attorneys from the beginning, and also Louise actually see him on these TV spots. This ends up with Tom being completely shocked because he's like, but this was a nobody guy. I think he's brilliant. And Tom's reaction is that he believes that Chauncey has calculated the whole thing. He's been played. Yeah. He he is completely convinced that he was, you know, getting faked out. This got over on me. Yeah. Is that how you would have reacted? How would have you, like, if this happened to you and you were Tom, what would have been your reaction? Well, unfortunately, I saw his wife in that scene. I was be like, stay home and bang the wife. 
I, it's true. It's true. He yeah. chooses instead of hanging out with his wife to yeah, go. Yeah, he's going to go out with Sally and get to the bottom of this. Who cares? He's a f vagina dirt. There was nothing to do in the 70s. Yeah. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> All right. Um, so Louise's response is very different to Tom's response. Yeah. Louise's response is that she is pissed. Right, she but she's she's watching from it looks like the lobby of a cheap hotel that she lives at, sitting around with a with like, a bunch of other people who live there. Yeah. And she says that it's for sure a white man's world in America. She also says that in between his ears was stuffed with rice pudding, which I think is a great line. She also alluded to him having a small penis early on. I don't remember that. It's when she's chiding him in the kitchen for not caring about the old man dying. Yeah. You ain't gonna do a young one any good. Not with that little thing of you. This guy's a real jerk. So yeah, Louise is watching him live on national TV and she's like, I just fed this guy oatmeal and he's about to become... The presidential advisor? <laughs> yes. Right. How? I feel yeah. like this guy is clearly not meant yeah, for this talking role. About How the did this happen? Yeah. So there's hope for us all, I think. <laughs> it's a beautiful scene. Yeah. Very, I'm only 52. Yuck. I could still... Very inspirational. Will you vote for me? Yes. I got one vote. Yes. It truly is a white man's world. <laughs> or beige. God, oh. As the film continues, Ben's illness prevents him from going to an event, so he asks Chauncey to escort Eve, which is obviously going to be a little bit risque because we already know that Eve is starting to develop an interest in Chauncey. Yeah, I think at this point, Ben has actually confronted Eve in a very um, cordial way, yeah. saying, you want to bag this guy? And she's like, yep. Yeah. And he's like, all right. And Eva's hesitant about that. She does give him a goodnight kiss. And then the next day, while Chauncey is watching Mr. Rogers, <laughs> instead of the news, <laughs> he chooses not to watch the news, which, you know, he's on the news. He is on the he news. He watches Mr. Yeah. Rogers, and Eve makes a move on him. Yeah. <laughs> which Chauncey does not reciprocate at all. This is an amazing scene. And it's more amazing than what you think the amazing scene is if you've seen this movie. So Shirley MacLaine comes in, interrupts Chauncey's perfect breakfast, by the way. Yes. It's a very delicious breakfast. And she just, all over the tray. My friend. All over Chauncey, kissing him. And, and I'm a kisser. Uh, I like kissing, but no response. And she's like, Chauncey, thank you for being so strong. Because I would have opened up. And he's like, well, Eve, thank you for not opening up. Having no idea what opening up is, yes. you loser. Could have had Shirley MacLaine for breakfast. You blew it, boy! Don't worry, things will happen later. <laughs> yeah. Awkward things will happen later. <laughs> His lack of reciprocation, she meets that to stoicness. And, yeah, and that this is, guy he gets just a pass understand. at every turn. Yes. So Chauncey and Eve go to the event, and everybody is completely enthralled by him. The men are impressed with his ability to talk. The women want to bang him. Everybody is just very excited to meet him, and this makes Eve want him even more. Yeah. He becomes that much more desirable. So guys, be more... You betcha. Yes, it works <laughs> wonderfully. Wear clothes from the 20s. Be... Yes. Um, also, in the in that scene when they're at the event, there is a very young Ilya Baskin. You in the minutia. I, I love know. it. Um, because he has the most recognizable face ever. Do you remember him? He's in Air Force One and uh, Moscow on the Hudson. Who could forget? He is so recognizable. I was like, oh my God, he's so young in this. This has got to be one of his first film roles. Well, Peter Sellers may have banged him. I mean, Shirley MacLaine might have also. <sighs> now I'm jealous. And then it turns out that the president is impotent. Is it me? Is it something I've done? Yeah, so there's some weird cuts to this. It becomes a slightly different movie, almost like the Zucker Brothers did yeah. this. It becomes that kind of comedy where it's like, oh, there's this thing happening, but it's a 30-second cut. And the president doesn't want his wife. So there's a lot of um, sex that's not happening. There's the realtor with his wife. Yeah. He has to leave town and get to the bottom of the case. And of course there's a uh, chance in What's Her Lips. And I'm sure Ben and Eve are not 
having sex also. Yeah, I would hope I not. I would suspect. <laughs> no one wants to see that. That would be my guess. It's very difficult. But I, I do think that that's important because it's the reality of what happens when we're in relationships versus the what happens in films. So in a lot of movies, we get to see all of those heavy-duty sex scenes, mm-hmm. and here we do not. We get to see the exact opposite of that. I mean, there's some hot gardening talk. We're getting to the very exciting Shirley MacLaine scene ah, pretty darn soon. Here we go. Yeah, so um, Eve again tries to make out with Chauncey, but he has no interest in that. In fact, he is watching television again. In the beginning of like her trying to make a move on him, he does the TV imitation thing again. So he saw like a couple spinning on television while like yes. embracing and beautiful. So he does that. To this you. is a close up. Yes. So there's a tight shot and you will see a little bit of emotion from Peter Sell's character here. And he is holding his cards tight as an actor because that is the entire strategy of this. He's got two things that he wants to do that he knows of. He might want to bang people, but he's just discovering that. He wants a garden, and he wants to watch TV. That's it. That is it. That's his whole motive in all of his life. He also begged for this role. Do you know that? I did not read that. Yeah. I did a little research. I did not heard about him begging for a role. People begged him. So at this point, his career was kind of in the decline. Hmm. And he, he, I believe that he wrote a letter to Hal Ashby saying, I am Chauncey. Well, I believe that. And he is. Yeah, I don't want to get into deep with Peter Sellers, but he is notably devoid of a personality yeah. by design, by method acting, by his own accord. He um, was... Blank. Which is exactly why this role was so perfect. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. You need a blank person for this. Yes. I mean, I could have done it. But. That leads me into another good point, which is that Laurence Olivier turned down the part. I did read that. Of Chauncey. Yeah. And the reason that he turned down that part is because... It's too blank? Is because he did not want to be in a movie where there was a Shirley MacLaine masturbation scene. Ah. Uh, what an idiot. So, Shirley, in response to their spinning and romance situation chauncey says well i would like to watch and shirley mclean eve takes that to mean that he wants to watch her masturbate so she throws herself around on a bearskin rug <sighs> oh amazing Oh my god, that scene is... <laughs> that, for me, is the scene that, like, I was like, okay, I love this movie, but then I was like, what the fuck? Because right. while she is <laughs> having fun on the bearskin rug... Right. Let's now. Uh, this exercise. Uh, the ch- he is watching television where there are pelvic floor exercises happening. <laughs> yes. And he is just imitating that. Yeah. <laughs> His pelvic floor is doing great. Yeah, so in between orgasms, she's glancing up saying, oh, I'm doing a good job because he's getting up. Yeah. And yeah, and her rolling around the floor, I had forgotten about. I mean, everyone remembers the scene. Yeah. But the minutia of the scene is the most important. She gives the (laughs) masturbation of a lifetime. Yes. Which again, Laurence Olivier, he really missed out. (laughs) He really did. I couldn't imagine this movie, though, with Laurence Olivier. I think that Peter Sellers was the perfect Chauncey. Yeah. Well, if you're my age... You would have seen Peter Sellers through so many films at that point. Yeah. This really was uh, the great end to his career, and it's unfortunate that I think he ended with um, the fiendish plot of Dr. Fu Manchu. Oh. Yeah. I myself spoke to the President of the United States, Nathan. You did? Yep. What did he say? Well, well, he naturally started off with... uh, Hello, Commissioner Avery! Yes, well, I just think he did. Long way to call from Washington just to say, 
Hello, Commissioner Avery. I mean, uh, is he a friend of yours? Do you know him? <laughs> no, no, he began with, hello, Commissioner well, Avery, and then he went on to matters of a most severe and urgent nature. Yes, an urgent nature. Meanwhile, it was a terrible film. He did, he did pass away, I think it was like within a year of this being released. Yeah. Which is a tragedy. I think that there's some interesting stuff about his death, too. We're going to fact check this, but I believe that he died and then his son died on the same date, like 20 years later. There's some interesting stuff with his passing. The quote on his gravestone is actually significant to this movie as well. Ben says that he is going to surrender, aka he is going to die, and he asks Chance to take care of Eve. This is one of the worst death scenes I've seen, and not because it's brutal. So this guy, Melvin... Douglas. Goes, ugh. <laughs> not the best. No. I could die better than that. You'll no. probably watch me die better than No, that. it's not. But we do get to see in that scene a fair amount of Chauncey watching him die, so, and that part is beautiful. All right, so this is the first time that Chauncey shows emotion, and it fills you with emotion, and if you don't get filled with emotion, you are not Human. A, an earthling. It happens. The doctor asks him after Ben dies, you really he, are... He's been doing a little research. Yeah. He says, you really are just a gardener, aren't you? This is the first time that we realize the humanity of Chauncey, mm -hmm. or at least that other people are realizing the humanity of him. That's a good point. His reaction to the doctor's question is, oh, yeah, and that's it. I never wanted to be a star. I never wanted any of this. I just wanted to be fed by Louise, who apparently was a good cook. Yeah. Who the fuck knows? Oatmeal. <laughs> well, oatmeal's good, but, you know. Okay. Th there's other things. All right. <laughs> we realize where we're at. The score is evident. Yes. And the film concludes with Ben's funeral. The funeral scene is extremely interesting, and I think that it ties the whole film together. Because the eulogy that is being read at the funeral is just Ben's own quotes, talking about how he hates welfare people. I have no use for those on welfare. Yeah, just to back Oof. up, if we didn't drive this home enough, you hear a lot of TV throughout the film pretty much underlining the dialogue, yeah. moving it along, moving the plot along possibly, underscoring it. It's it's never contrast. And then what you hear between the dialogue of the uh, pallbearers and the eulogy. The pallbearers, we get to hear this eulogy, and at the same time, the pallbearers um, are not at all somber. Instead, no. they are talking about... Yeah, they're planning. They're planning Ben's replacement. Yes, I agree. Except he's so boring. What about Max? Well, he could never take an election. I could Correct. never conceive... And their solution to Ben's replacement is that Chauncey is their only way to maintain the presidency. So they still are of the mindset that Chauncey is great and wonderful and all-knowing and full of enlightenment. So who's the beauty pie? Suck on my Come on. It's us. Oh, right. I mean us as a society, not you and I. We get to see Ben's mausoleum is like one of those triangles which says life is a state of mind, which again is the most Hal Ashby thing in the entire world. Yeah, it's me. also the last quote of the movie. It is, yeah. yes. The last thing, one of the last things that we get to see is Chauncey walking across water. He tends to a tree, and then he just walks out on top of the water. Dips his umbrella in. Sees that it does, in fact, sink. Life is a state of mind. Yeah. So how do you interpret the ending? All right. I don't think, it, I don't think it's as deep as people have made it out to be. I think it's an I ignorance is bliss analogy. I think it's like anyone could be here. Anyone could be in Washington. Yes. I, get, I get the political thing. You hammered it home, buddy. But also... I think that the heart of the movie was about innocence. I don't think it was about yeah. evil politics. Yeah. It's just how someone could become so intrinsic in something else by accident. And I think it still happens all the time. But I don't want to go there. I completely agree with you. I think that he is able to walk on water because he doesn't know that he can't. Um, That's a good way of putting it. 
I think that it, I think it's extremely simplistic, you know? He knows the universe through television, so he can do whatever he's going to want to do, and it's just beautiful. That's a good way of putting it. Also, again, he dips that umbrella to the right of where he's walking, which is a good way of saying, I don't know what I'm doing. In fact, here's what I can't do. So if you want to skip to the end of the movie and watch that and then watch the rest, you'll see what I'm talking about. It's quite beautiful. Although I do think that there, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, I think that there's an interpretation that could be had that he is just a ghost. So like, does right. he really exist? Or an angel, as you put it? I Does he exist? Or is he a figment of everybody's imagination? Well, that's for a I'm, bonus episode, Kaylee. Yeah, I mean, it, that's a huge way to think about the end of this film, but I do think that there is room to be able to say, maybe he doesn't really exist. And and maybe even it was Hal Ashby's commentary on the monolith from 2001 even further. Perhaps he is the monolith of this film. Does he exist? Does he have meaning? Is he anything? And that fucks with me a lot, and I don't have a good answer to that question, but right. I, I do think it's an interesting thought exercise. It's interesting. I don't want that to be the interpretation. Yeah, I don't either. I want actually. the I want <laughs> yeah. the interpretation to be he doesn't know that no. he can't, so he does. Keep it the way it is. This guy wandered into people's lives, and it, it changed their perception of everything. I think it's yes. just about perception. Yeah. He was there. Yeah. A ghost can't do that. No. It can't do that. Unless it's Pac-Man. I don't know. That, <laughs> then They changed my perception. God damn it. We're fucked. How'd you guys like to do a little pac plumbing? So the movie actually ends. That is like the most memorable end scene. But we end uh... with TV static. And then we roll credits. And then we have Peter Sellers' least favorite thing in the entire world that he blames him not getting an Oscar for. Which is that Hal Ashby put in the end credits his outtakes of doing the Raphael monologue. Now get this honky. <laughs> I was, sorry, carry on. Yeah, so this is actually the scene that was cut for some reason. Yeah. Probably because they couldn't get through it. Yeah. I ain't taking no jive. <laughs> it is fucking hilarious. And all, all, the character of Chauncey's trying to do is ask this guy who's trying to take x-rays of him because he's only experienced like two black people at this point in his life. Well, you must know Raphael, right? Yeah. I gotta get this message to you. You tell that asshole if he... <laughs> he was adamant that the whole reason that he didn't win an Oscar for this is because that was included at the end. What's this nuts from Kramer and Kramer won it? Yeah. Which was well deserved. I'm Kramer. Whoa. I'm Kramer. Peter Sellers was literally like It's not Kramer and Kramer, it's Kramer. Kramer versus, versus Kramer. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Peter Sellers is amazing in this movie. Yeah. But it's not the reason that he didn't win the Oscar because I think the end credits are really fucking great. And a lot was happening in 1979. Yeah. Alien. And? Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. <laughs> yes. Let me take you down, cause I'm going to strawberry fields. Who could forget? <laughs> All right. And the rest. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was absolutely wonderful. Do you have anything else that you want to talk about when it comes to this movie? Jeez, I, I think we covered it all. It resonates with me for a lot of reasons. I'm a Change it. gardener. I think we covered it. Well, I love on my channel to rate movies out of seven thumbs up. Seven? Yes. I thought, uh, I, thought I knew your show. It's entirely too many. It's a Simpsons reference, too. Come on. Seven thumbs up. I'm back in. Yeah. Uh, so what would you rate this movie out of seven thumbs up? I give it six. I think that that's respectable. And if you have a green thumb, you get the extra thumb. I guess I have a green thumb because I would give it seven out of seven thumbs wow. up. Wow. I love this movie. That's a perfect movie. I think that it is up there in some of the best films of all time. I yeah. think that it is one of those perfect satirical existential, you know, question marks of a movie. Absolutely. And it works so well for me. It is a movie that I want to watch back to back with things like Brazil and... Um, Good call. All of that stuff where I I have to question existence. Yeah. And I love that. Yeah, pretty much any Terry Gilliam movie, actually. It's true. Touches on this. Yes. What is real, what isn't. Yes. 
This one pretty much gives it to you. This is our reality, but you make the choice afterwards. Absolutely. And that that is something why I and a billion people love it. It really has stood the test of time. It really from has. 1979. I, I dare you not to watch it. It's yeah. fucking beautiful. It is. All right, well, thank you again so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Will you tell everybody one more time where they can find you? You can find me on WATP, Who Are These Podcasts. Go to whoarethese.com and hackamania.com, where we will be in Vegas doing a live show. Yeah. Someone named Lucy Tightbox is going to be promoting her garbage there. and uh, Never heard of her. (laughs) All right, wonderful. Thank you so much again, producer Chris, for being here. And thank you guys so much for watching. And I can't wait. Next one. Everything's better than cockle. <laughs>